everyone. I hope everyone was able to log in okay and get settled in. Um, my name is Tremaine Lindsay, and I'm the Vice President of Equity and Inclusion here at Minneapolis College. Um, and I would like to begin today's event uh, by acknowledging that Minneapolis College sits on and occupies the original and contemporary homelands of the Anishinaabe people um, and the Dakota people. Furthermore, acknowledging that the state of Minnesota was and still is land stolen from the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. I would like to welcome each and every one of you here today uh, to the launch of our anti-racism uh, speaker series. After the murder of George Floyd, Minneapolis College made the declaration to become an anti-racist institution. So in our pursuit of becoming an anti-racist institution, we felt that it was important to create opportunities to further educate our campus in the subject around anti-racism. So with the launch of this speaker series, it will serve as host to scholars, educators, authors, community activists that are all engaging in our campus community and actualizing our efforts of becoming anti-racist. At this particular time, I would like to invite Minneapolis College President Sharon Pierce to share some opening remarks. President Pierce. Thank you, Tremaine, and welcome everyone. We are happy that you are here and we are excited to launch this new speaker series. Minneapolis College has a long history of commitment to actively engaging in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, we approach this work now, as Tremaine mentioned, with a renewed sense of urgency, purpose, and intentionality. We're committed to doing the hard things, having the difficult conversations, and getting down to the business of dismantling systemic racism. We realize becoming an anti-racist institution is a journey and not a destination. And as on any difficult journey, we welcome the support of friends, allies, and fellow journeymen. So thank you for being here, for joining us on our shared journey. I am looking forward to hearing from our first guest, Tim Wise, and hope you will join us when we host future guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you for those words, President Pierce. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce our speaker of the hour, uh, Tim Wise. Uh, Tim Wise is amongst uh, the most prominent anti-racist writers and educators in the United States. He has spent the past 25 years speaking to audiences in over 50 states, in all 50 states, and over 1,500 colleges and high school campuses, at hundreds of professional and academic conferences, and to community groups across the country. Wise has also trained corporate, government, entertainment, media, law enforcement, military, and medical industry professionals on methods of dismantling racial inequity in their institutions, and has provided anti-racism training to educators and administrators nationwide and internationally in Canada and Bermuda. Wise is the author of nine books, including his latest, Dispatches from the Race War. Other books include Under the, Under the Affluence, Dear White America, Letter to a New Minority, and Colorblind, all from City Lights books. His highly acclaimed memoir, White Like Me, Reflections on Race from a Privileged Son, um, recently updated and re-released through Skull Press, you can find that there, Affirmative Action and Racial Preference in Black and White, Speaking Treason, Treason, I can't talk today, uh, fluently anti-racist reflections from, uh, from an angry white male and between Barack and a hard place, racism and white denial in the age of Obama. Named one of the 25 visionaries who are changing the world, Wise, was con Wise has contributed to over um, chapters or essays to over 25 additional books and his writings are taught in colleges and universities across the nation. His essays have appeared on Alternet, Salon, Huffington Post, Counterpunch, The Root, Black Commentator, BK Nation, and Z Magazine, among other popular professional and scholarly journals. From 1999 to 2003, Wise was an advisor to the Fisk University Race Relations Institute in Nashville. And in the early 90s, he was a youth coordinator and associate director of the Louisiana Coalition Against Racism and Nazi Nazism the largest of the many groups organized 
for the purpose of defeating neo-Nazi political candidate, David Duke. Wise has been featured in several documentaries, including two from the Media Education Foundation, White Like Me, Race, Racism, and White Privilege in America, which he co-wrote and co-produced, has been called a phenomenal educational tool in the struggle against racism and one of the best films on the unfinished quest for racial justice. The Great White Hoax, Donald Trump, and the political and the politics of race and class in America features Wise's, features Wise explores how American political leaders on both parties have been taping, tapping into white anxiety, stoking white grievance, and scapegoating people of color for decades to provide and conquer working class voters and shore up political support. Wise also appears alongside legendary scholar and activist Angela Davis in the 2011 documentary, Vocabulary of Change. In his public dialogue between the two activists, Davis and Wise discuss the connections uh, between issues of race, class, gender, sexuality, and militarism, as well as intergenerational movement building and the prospects of social change. More recently, he appeared on Chelsea Handler's Netflix documentary, Hello Privilege, It's Me Chelsea, on white privilege and racism in the United States. Wise appears regularly on CNN and MSNBC to discuss race issues and was featured in a 2017 segment on 2020. He graduated from Tulane University in 1990 and received anti-racism training from the People's Institute of Survival and Beyond in New Orleans. He is also the host of the podcast, Speak Out with Tim Wise. At this time, I would like to give a warm virtual welcome to our speaker of the hour, Tim Wise. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to start off by apologizing for the ridiculous length of that bio. I'm going to cut that in half or down by two thirds. It's like I'm applying for a job or something. You know, it's a little obnoxious. I apologize for that. The important thing is you're here. I'm here. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to come and chat with you and share some thoughts. Let me uh, let me issue a bit of a disclaimer before I get started. I've learned in this age of uh, Zoom calls and and virtual events that I have to do this because if I don't, something will happen with the technology and then I'll feel bad for not having said it. Uh, just know this, I am uh, not good with the technology. I'm a 53-year-old man, which means that uh, any technology that is more recent than like 1981 Atari video games is way beyond my pay grade. So there's a very good chance that I'm going to hit a button. Uh, I'm going to disconnect like the entire internet at least on my block. Uh, it's not going to be your fault. If the tech goes down, I'm sure y'all have got it under control. It's me, but I have the link and I will follow it back and I will get back to you. You just never know what's going to happen. We've been having some weather here in Nashville where I live. So I'm just trying to cover all my bases, let you know what might happen. Hopefully it will not. Uh, hopefully we won't have any interruptions. And uh, once I'm done with the sort of formal remarks that I'm going to make, we'll do some Q&A and have some conversation. Uh, it is good to be with you, even though I'm not really with you. We're doing this thing that we've been doing now for a couple of years at some point, uh, love to be able to get back up and and uh, and share some time and some space with you all up there in Minneapolis. Um, for right now, let me say that it is a, a critical time, as you know, and, and I think the introductory remarks uh, spoke to that. Uh, a critical time, not only in, in the city's history where you are and also here in Nashville where I am, but all around, all around the country uh, with regard to issues of racial justice and equity since the murder of George Floyd in 2020, uh, coming up on on, uh, on two years now, we have been in the middle of, and it doesn't always feel this way because sometimes, you know, it's at a higher point than other points, but we have been in the middle of, in the midst of the largest racial justice uprising uh, in the country's history, just in raw numbers, right? After the killing of George Floyd, literally millions, some estimates suggest as many as 25 million different Americans, including millions who had never really been involved in the racial justice struggle, took to the streets, went to protest demonstrations, public events, or if not, that kind of activity nonetheless started engaging these issues in their schools, uh, in their workplaces, in their neighborhood organizations and community groups. So we had lots of people in the summer of 2020 and all throughout 2020, as well as throughout 2021 and now into 2022, engaging these issues at a much higher level than previously had been the case. 
and we are still in the middle of that racial justice uprising, but we are also, as you know, uh, in the midst of a racial justice backlash to that uprising. And we have been virtually since the beginning, but certainly all throughout last year and into this year, the pushback against the work that was being done, the movement that was being grown uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. We've seen it at the state level and at the federal level, state after state, now 15 states that have passed some form of legislation to restrict the teaching of racial race uh, history, accurate history about racial injustice in America. They call it uh, critical race theory, but really if I were to put a gun to the heads of those criticizing critical race theory and tell them that they had 10 minutes to tell me what it actually was, I assure you none of them could do so. I don't advocate uh, putting a gun to anyone's head, by the way, it's purely uh, uh, just an example of, of what would happen if we did that. Uh, but that's what they're saying. They're attacking critical race theory, attacking anti-racist education, attacking accurate history, looking to have historical materials removed from classrooms. If those materials talk about the subject matter that was raised so prominently and so prevalently in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, if they talk about issues of systemic injustice, if they talk about issues of institutional and structural racism, we have lawmakers around the country and some at the federal level who would want to shut down the ability of educators in K-12 and also in higher education, public higher education, to have those kinds of conversation, not only anti-racist education, but DEI work, this, this concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which to be honest, those of us who refer to ourselves as anti-racist historically have sort of joked about the DEI language, right? Sort of joked about how that was like the minimum diversity and equity and inclusion. Those are not particularly radical words. They're not particularly radical concepts. They don't necessarily suggest fundamental institutional transformation. And yet even those three letters, meaning diversity, equity, and inclusion, that has come under attack with state after state looking at ways to restrict the very kind of conversation that we're having right now, looking to limit the ability of public institutions of education to even engage these kinds of topics. Any suggestion that America is systemically, structurally, or institutionally racially unjust and has been since its inception and still the country suffers from that, any suggestion that that's true is apparently worthy in the eyes of an awful lot of powerful people, worthy of censorship. Now, on the one hand, this shouldn't surprise us because as Carol Anderson, brilliant scholar uh, at Emory University talks about in her book, White Rage, which I highly recommend uh, everyone read, whenever there has been progress forward on the road to racial justice, particularly for black folk, but really for people of color generally, whenever we have begun to move forward substantively or even symbolically, to move forward, uh, that forward progress has been met with white rage and white backlash. It happened after emancipation during the pushback against reconstruction. It happened when black folks moved north and out west during the great migration, leaving sharecropping in the south were met with violence and race riots, uh, pogroms of violence against their communities. It happened in the wake of desegregation of schools, particularly in the south, but not only in the south, we saw it all around the country when busing and desegregation came to uh, public education in the 1970s. We saw this white backlash and rage in response to affirmative action. We saw it in response to the election of Barack Obama, which was interesting because the election of President Obama didn't really substantively change things on the ground for most black and brown people in America, but symbolically, right, the actual having of a president of color with uh, what some viewed as an exotic name and background different from other American leaders, right? Sort of shook some people up. They couldn't quite get their head around it. And so we had the birther controversy. We had all this pushback against a black man leading the United States of America. Again, Carol Anderson's book, White Rage talks about that. And then now in the wake of the racial justice uprising, even though policies really haven't changed, with regard to policing in very many parts of our country. Laws haven't changed that have eliminated structural racism from the criminal justice system or from housing or from schooling or from healthcare delivery or anywhere else. But even in the lack of, even in the absence of systemic and structural change, just the narrative change that's taken place in the last two years, just the fact that we're using language 
like systemic racism. Just the fact that 20 million or so people went into the streets, including millions of white folks who had never talked about these things and, and joined this struggle, that, as you can imagine, scared some people, right? Because now it meant that the narrative, the, the conversation, the discourse, the language that we were using was going to shift. And so as Carol Anderson would predict, looking back at history, we would expect this kind of backlash to happen. In a lot of ways, that is evidence that the medicine is starting to work. I know it sometimes makes us feel as though that, that pushback is going to, going to take us back to a place uh, before the racial justice uprising, but let me suggest to you that it's evidence that the medicine is working. You know, when you're sick as a kid and your parents give you cough medicine or whatever, because you got a hack you can't get rid of, and they, they give you that medicine, it never tastes good. They try to make it taste good. They put syrup in there, sugar and stuff, and, and try to you know make it not taste so bad, but you still screw up your face and you, you make a face and whatever it is that's getting you healthy, whatever it is that actually helps you get better is the part that obviously doesn't taste very good. So in this particular instance, now that we're talking about systemic racism, now that we're hearing that phraseology, we have people talking about systemic privilege and injustice in ways that I assure you five years ago, they were not. 10 years ago, they were not. 20 years ago, they were not. I've been out lecturing and going around the country for 26 years. And I promise you for the first 24 of those, it was like pulling teeth to get people to even hear those words or, or even understand what they meant. Now we have millions of people using that language. So that's the good news, right? The discourse has begun to shift, but in the midst of this backlash, our obligation uh, as people committed to racial justice and anti-racism is to figure out how do we meet this backlash and move through it? How do we not succumb to it? How do we continue to move forward in the face of that kind of resistance, which is only going to get stronger, right? The more successful that you are in challenging the status quo, the more successful you are in changing the discourse, the more of that pushback you're going to get. So you can take heart in the backlash in the sense that you're obviously striking a nerve, but you have to be prepared for it and you have to know what to do in the face of it. So that's what I wanna talk about today. How does your institution meet this moment and continue to push through this moment to come out on the other side as a fully anti-racist institution? How do we stay strong in our commitment to creating equitable anti-racist institutions, not only with regard to higher ed, but certainly with regard to higher ed? Uh, the first part of that that I wanna talk about is the crucial aspect of always maintaining a systemic analysis and a systemic framework and leading with that. Now, what do I mean by that? Because we hear this term systemic racism thrown around a lot, but we don't always clarify what we mean. So let me be very clear about what I mean. Part of the reason that we have so much backlash to this conversation right now is because for a lot of just average everyday white folks who really aren't familiar with the discourse of racial equity and some of the material that you all are looking at as you try to move forward as an anti-racist institution. The reason there's so much pushback is because people are hearing one thing even when we're saying something else. So we want to be very clear about what we're saying so that people don't have any excuse for misunderstanding. I remember uh, last year, maybe it was 2020, in the middle of, of the uprising when folks would get very upset with the phrasing of systemic racism, they would say, well, what are, you, what are you saying? Are you calling me a racist? Are you saying that that everyone in my company or all the teachers in the schools or, or, or everyone at the bank or all the cops, they're all just racist bigots? Is that what you're saying? Here's the thing. When we're talking about systemic racism, we're not saying that. That's not the argument at all. The whole point of discussing systemic racism is to get away from that whole debate about who's a racist and who's not a racist. Are you a racist? Well, what about you? Am I a racist? Well, you're one, but I'm not. That, that whole discourse is irrelevant to a conversation about systems and structures. This isn't about good people over here and bad people over here. But if people think that that's what we're saying when we talk about systemic racism, and becoming an anti-racist institution, then they get very defensive, right? Because they think you're talking badly about them. You're, you're, you're suggesting they're a bad person. I'm not interested in that. I'm not saying that individual bias doesn't matter. Obviously, people who carry around individual bias can do a lot of damage. So I'm not suggesting that it's irrelevant. But what I'm saying is that the creation 
of anti-racist institutions does not rely upon the eradication of all the personal bias that's out there. It'd be nice if we could eradicate all the personal bias, but you know, I'm not your therapist. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know how to do mass conversion therapy from bias to non-bias. I mean, I wouldn't even know how to do that if that was the point. But I do understand how we can begin to build institutional firewalls against personal bias so that even if folks are acting on the basis of bias, maybe it's overt, maybe it's subconscious, but they won't be able to do damage because we will have in place systemic frameworks to continue moving forward, even when those folks are in the picture. There are always going to be some fools in the picture that are biased and that carry around personal level racism. You're not going to get rid of all of them, but you can make sure that what's up here in their head doesn't come out here in the institutional space, which is where people get hurt right, which is where people become marginalized. So maintaining a systemic focus allows us to get away from the sort of finger pointing approach, right, which is judging individuals and saying, you're the problem, right? Nobody likes being told they're the problem, even if they are the problem, let alone if they're not. And sometimes individuals are not. Sometimes we're in spaces that have been created by people years before that we're not to blame for, we just sort of inherit the legacy of those institutional spaces. We inherit the policies, we inherit the procedures, we inherit the practices, we inherit the paradigms of thought that existed in our colleges and in our K-12 educational system and in our policing and justice system and in our neighborhood and housing system and in our job market, we inherit all of that, right? And so you can be a good person with all the best of intentions, not wanting to harm anyone, not wanting to discriminate or oppress or marginalize anyone. But if you find yourself in an institutional space that has policies, practices, and procedures that marginalize people, even though you're a good person with good intentions, you may be unable to do good work because the institution will have more of an effect on you than you will on the institution. Right? You can be a, a good person in a bad and broken institution, and it's an open question as to which side of that equation is going to carry the day. Are you going to change the space, or is the space going to change you? You can think about this with policing, right? which is one of the areas that we've been focused on, obviously, uh, in particular since the killing of George Floyd. You can be an individual who got into law enforcement for all the right reasons, right? You might be from the community. You might have grown up and seen a lot of, of you know, criminal offending that you wanted to get involved in dealing with. You, you might not be in it to bust heads and, and hurt people. You might want to actually help keep people safe. But if you become part of an institution, the institution of law enforcement that has historically operated to marginalize less powerful people, not just black and brown folk, but poor folk and working class people of all races, then if that has been the history of law enforcement, and it has been unquestionably, I mean, policing was created for the purpose of protecting the haves from the have nots. That's its history in every society, not just in the United States, right? Law enforcement is about protecting the haves from the have nots because there's a fear that the have nots are gonna come and take the have stuff. Like that's essentially the history of policing. And in this country, there's been a clear racial element to that. So you could be a well-intended person, but if you go into that system and you speak up against the operation of that system as it has historically operated, what do you think is gonna happen? Are you gonna change that system or is that system gonna come down on you? Well, we have examples of individuals in law enforcement that are good folks who tried to stand up. And then what happens is they get run out of policing, right? Uh, there's a guy named uh, Joe Crystal uh, or Joe Wood, excuse me, you know, Joe Crystal in Baltimore and uh, another guy, Michael Wood Jr., both of them, white cops, went into policing in Baltimore, a city with a history of police misconduct and also very high crime rates. They went into policing for all the right reasons. One of them, I think his parents had been cops. The other one, they both were in the military. They wanted to go into it for the right reason. But when they got in and became law enforcement officers, they saw the corruption, they saw the brutality, they saw the racism that was going on in the Baltimore Police Department, and they tried to report it. And when they tried to report it, they were the ones who were criticized by their leadership in the department. They were the runs, ones that were run out of policing. They were the ones who, when they would get called out on crime calls, nobody would send backup for them. 
they would put dead rats in their cars, right? Because they were crossing that so-called thin blue line and they were violating the, the implied brotherhood and sisterhood of policing. And so ultimately they ended up leaving policing. They were good people with good intentions, but they were part of a broken system. So if we're gonna change the problem of racial inequity in law enforcement or brutality or corruption in law enforcement, you're not just gonna do it by having good people. You're gonna to have to change policies. You're gonna to have to change procedures. You have to fundamentally change the structures and the systems of public safety, right? You can think about that with schooling, right? You can think about teachers. I, I assume that educators, right, go into teaching, whether it's kindergarten or college, usually for the right reasons. You certainly don't go into it for the money, if you're gonna be a professor or you're gonna be a third grade teacher, you're not doing it to get rich. You can make a lot more money doing a lot of other stuff. Most people go into teaching because they believe in the fundamental enterprise of education. But the problem is that we live in a country where the system of schooling was created with very particular purposes in mind. And you know what? Those purposes were not anti-racist. And not only were they not anti-racist, that institutional space was deliberately racist and classist against working class people of all colors. It was intended to produce inequality. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can go back and listen to what some of the creators of that system said. So go back and look at what Thomas Jefferson said, for instance, uh, in Notes on the State of Virginia, one of the more famous things that he wrote, one of the few things, he really didn't write all that much, but one of the things that he wrote that is most well regarded is Notes on the State of Virginia. And in, the, in that particular writing, he talks about, uh, in that treatise, he talks about what education in the new country ought to look like, right? He was someone who was highly regarded as an educational thinker, founder of the University of Virginia, well-respected educational theorist of his day. And what Thomas Jefferson said was that what we needed in the new nation was compulsory education, but only like five or six years. And of course, only for white males. Like he didn't, he didn't mean that for black folks or indigenous people. He didn't mean it even for white girls, right? He just wanted white boys would go to school for like five or six years. And the reason why he wanted five or six years of schooling for the white boys was so that we could, and these are his words, not mine, rake a few geniuses from the rubbish, right? So what was Thomas Jefferson saying there? He was saying, and keep in mind, he's not even, he's not even thinking about black and brown people. He's not even thinking about white females. He's just thinking about white guys. And he basically just said, yeah, most of y'all are trash too, right? Like most of y'all are not gonna amount to anything. You're definitely not gonna live out here, you know, with me on this big plantation and you're not gonna run the country. Most of y'all are garbage. But if we give you six years of schooling, we can figure out like which ones are the geniuses and which ones are the garbage. So he was saying the point of schooling was not equality. It was not equity. It was not the great equalizer, right? Which is the term we use a lot of times nowadays. We say education is the great equalizer. Thomas Jefferson was telling you from the beginning the purpose was inequality, right? It was an unequalizer. And that was just even among white folks. He was slicing and dicing white men. Like here's garbage over here, geniuses over here. And then the women would be way back here, even the white ones. And then the black and brown folks would be even further back, right? So the purpose of schooling in the eyes of those who initiated that system in our country was for the purpose of inequality. So if that's its history, let's follow the trajectory and see if it's changed. Fast forward to the early 1900s and Woodrow Wilson, who of course would become president of the United States. But before that, he was the president of Princeton University. And he was also a very well-respected educational thinker in his time, right? Someone that people turn to for insights on how schooling ought to operate in the United States. And one of the things he said was very similar to something Jefferson had said over a hundred years before. What did Wilson say? He said that what we need is one group of people, a small group, he said, to prepare themselves for the receipt of a liberal education. Now, when he used that term, that didn't mean liberal like we think of liberal versus conservative. That was the term they used to use for college. They just called it a liberal education. So one group should prepare themselves for college, basically, is what he's saying. And then he went on to say another group, much larger by necessity in this and every society should forego the privilege of a liberal slash college education and instead prepare themselves for the performance of certain difficult manual tasks, right? Now, what is, what is Wilson saying? It's very similar to Jefferson. 
He said it a little differently, but basically what he just said was, we need a handful of y'all to go to college and the rest of y'all to carry stuff and lift heavy things. We need some of y'all to sweat and some of y'all to think. So he's, and again, Woodrow Wilson is not even thinking about black and brown people when he says that. He's, he, he didn't intend for black and brown folks to get an education, certainly, right? In that era, in that particular time and given his own racial views, which were incredibly racist. Uh, one of our really more blatantly racist presidents, as a matter of fact. But he was just talking about white people. He was saying, even for white folks, like most of y'all do not need to go to college. You do not need to get any real education beyond maybe a few years. Y'all just need to go do heavy lifting and manual tasks that me and other really well-educated people are too special to do. So he's saying the same thing Jefferson's saying, we're going to have the rubbish over here doing the hard work, we're going to have the geniuses over here running things, and that's even just among white folks. So even Wilson is saying, as of the early 1900s, the point of school is not equality, it's not to be an equalizer, it is to keep things unequal because we prefer inequality, right? These are not my words, these are their words, I'm just sort of, you know, sort of analyzing what they mean. Now you might think, well, okay, but this is it's been a long time ago. Woodrow Wilson's been dead a long time. That's the early 1900s. It's been over a century since he said that. All right, let's move it forward. Early 2000s, I think it was 2001. I'm watching one of the Sunday talk shows and uh, they were talking about the no child left behind law that had just been passed uh, and signed by the Bush administration. I think it was 01. And um, they had William Bennett, on the Sunday talk show. He was the former secretary of education during the Reagan administration. And so they had him on to talk about this new education reform for K-12 schools. And they asked him about the bill. And then they asked Bill Bennett, former secretary of education, Secretary Bennett, what do you think the biggest challenge or biggest problem facing American education today is? Now that's a big, huge, weighty question, right? It's the kind of question that if you ask me that question on national television, I'd probably want like a commercial break or like, give me a second. Let me have a sip of water or something. Let me think about it. Right. Because they don't want to get that one wrong. Like that's a big question. But when they asked that to Bill Bennett, he did not need a commercial break. He did not need a sip of water. He did not need to clear his throat. Right. He was ready with an answer. They said, Mr. Secretary, what's the biggest problem in American education? And his answer as of 2001 just two decades ago, essentially the current moment was, well, the biggest problem is that too many people are going to college. And I remember sitting there watching and thinking, well, now who is he, who is he talking about? Because he didn't say, right? Like he didn't specify who was going that shouldn't be going. But that's what he's saying. Like there's too many people going. There's some folks going to college that just shouldn't be going. Well, who are they? And what should they be doing instead? You know, we know what Woodrow Wilson said they should be doing, difficult manual tasks. We know what Jefferson said, that they were rubbish, right? Who certainly didn't need any form of higher education. So what is Bill Bennett saying? Well, they didn't really push him on the show, but I'm sitting there thinking like, who does he mean? And I started by working backwards because I knew who he didn't mean, right? When Bill Bennett said too many people are going to college, let's start with who we know he's not talking about. He's not talking about rich, mediocre people, right? I've known a lot of rich, mediocre people in my life. A lot of them have run this country. A lot of them have run, you know, a lot of them worked on Wall Street and damn near bankrupted the, the United States economy and the global economy. Those were all very well educated, but incredibly mediocre. And I might point out mostly white guys who wrecked the economy in 2008, 29, 2010 right? Lost about, what, 20% of the accumulated net worth of the United States that it took over 230 years to build, and they wiped it out in 18 months with either unethical or, in some cases, illegal investment activity and financial activity. So those are all very rich people, very powerful people, and incredibly untalented when it comes to running the economic system or banking and financial system of the United States, those folks, nobody ever says they shouldn't go to college. Like after that, we didn't go back and go, man, you know, all these kids coming out of prep school whose daddies were bankers and lawyers, we got to just step in and just stop this madness. They just can't go to college anymore. Look at them. Look, you get a little education, they go wreck Wall Street. We didn't tell those folks that they should go do manual labor. We didn't tell those folks maybe they ought to go work in a warehouse or maybe they ought to go work at McDonald's. No, if you're rich and mediocre, it doesn't matter. You're going to college. No one goes to the prep schools and says to like the, the C student or the D student that they shouldn't go to college or they shouldn't go to law school or they shouldn't try to inherit daddy's business. Like you're clearly not qualified. Look at your grades. 
I mean, there's always somebody that graduates last, even at the fanciest prep school in America, right? You got the valedictorian up here and somebody is like, whatever the opposite of the valedictorian is, somebody's there and no one ever says to them, ah, you know, I know you went to this really fancy prep school and your folks spent a lot of money, but I just think you just need to go into the workforce and not go to college. So Bill Bennett wasn't talking about them. It's assumed that they're going to go to college. So who is he talking about? Who's left? The rich and mediocre are always going to go. What he's talking about is working class people, because those are the folks who would be accessing college education more now than in the past, especially through community colleges, right? But also through larger four-year institutions, both public and private. And he's talking about folks of color who in the past would not have been going in numbers as large as today. Those are the only groups who increasingly are going who weren't already going, right? The rich folks were already going. So he wouldn't have said that about them. He's talking about the newcomers. He's talking about the folks that are coming into higher ed now who in previous generations maybe wouldn't. Now, he didn't say that, but he didn't have to, did he? So what he's just said is the same thing Jefferson was saying, the same thing Woodrow Wilson was saying. Over 220 or 230 years of educational leaders in our country, and they're all basically saying the same thing, that the purpose of education is inequality. And if all these folks go to college, that gets in the way, right? Because if the working class goes and if black and brown folks go, sort of like the mentality of the slave owner, right? If they all learn to read, who's going to pick the cotton, right? I mean, really, like if they all learn to read, who's going to do that work? Well, if they all go to college, who's going to pick up the garbage and who's going to change the bedpans in the hospitals and who's going to change the sheets at the hotels? Because we assume that that work is beneath the level of a college graduate. That's our assumption. Shouldn't be our assumption, but that's our assumption. And so we have people at the very pinnacle of American institutions who over the course of 230 years have said the same thing. Schooling is supposed to produce inequality, y'all, not equality. So if you have a systemic framework as an institution trying to be anti-racist, you have to start with that historical grounding because if you're a person involved in an institutional space that was set up for one purpose, and you don't know that that was the purpose for which it was set up, you're going to have a hell of a time changing its function, right? Because it's like going to the sausage factory, right? And thinking that like, if you just change a couple things on the machine, it'll give you chicken nuggets. Like that's not how it works. It's a sausage factory. It produces sausage. You're gonna have to retool the whole thing. You're gonna have to change the input to get different output. You're gonna have to start over from scratch. You can't just tinker with the machinery, in order to get a different outcome, if you have educational systems that were set up to favor some and marginalize others, and you want to do something different, you have to really get involved at the root of what the problem is and think about all the different policies, the different practices, the different procedures that you might have to revisit in order to go from point A to point B and all the way down the line, right? And if we don't understand that history, we get real frustrated. I think a lot of times we don't understand that systemic history. We don't understand the, the way that these systems were structured. And so we get frustrated and we think, well, if we can just get some more money, right? If we can just get a, more money from the state, bigger budget, maybe some more training dollars, right? I'm not saying that the money doesn't matter. The money does matter. But the problem is you keep throwing money at a system that was set up to produce inequality, what you'll end up with is better financed inequality, right? You have to actually start questioning some of the underlying assumptions of education and not only higher education, right? You also have to think about the way that the K-12 system feeds into the schooling and the work that you all do there at the college, right? Because you're inheriting the legacy of a profoundly unequal K-12. And you can't be expected to fundamentally undo the damage of that unequal K-12. So you have to figure out how to partner with those K-12 institutions, teachers, counselors, principals, assistant principals, communities, families whose kids are in those K-12 systems. You have to be connected to them as joint stakeholders in producing not just an anti-racist college, right? which can't be produced in a vacuum, but an anti-racist educational structure in the city of Minneapolis going all the way from kindergarten or pre-K through college, right? You have to be able to do both of those things together because trying to create an anti-racist college or, or higher educational system on the, on the foundation of a fundamentally racially disparate K-12 is going to be very difficult. So we have to have a partnership there 
that uh, begins much earlier than, than simply at the college level. We also have to understand from a systemic framework that we are dealing with oftentimes the unintended consequences of policies, practices, and procedures. It's not always a matter of people deliberately creating injustice to harm people. Does that happen sometimes? Of course. But if you think about the job market and how people get jobs, a lot of times people are getting jobs not because, or being denied jobs, not because somebody in the HR department of a company is overtly racist or overtly sexist or overtly whatever, but because so many jobs are given out as the result of networks and connections. So I know Jim over in the, you know, in the accounting department, and Jim puts in a good word for me, or I know Bill over in the HR and Bill writes a letter of recommendation saying, hey, Tim's my neighbor. I play golf with him. We play ball at the gym, blah, blah, blah. I know him really well. He'd be great for this upcoming job. You may think that's not a big deal, but a study done just a few years ago found that almost half the jobs in America as of you know, maybe eight, nine years ago, and I doubt it's changed very much, about half the jobs were being filled through that kind of process, right? People who already work for an institution recommending somebody they know. And who are the people who are disproportionately going to be left out of those networks? They're disproportionately going to be black and brown folks. They're disproportionately going to be women of all colors. They're disproportionately going to be working class. So you could be the most qualified person for that staff opening at the college, for instance, not necessarily a faculty job because those jobs are given out differently, but a staff job, or you could be the most qualified person and you could be black or brown. You could be a woman of any color. You could be a working class white person, but if you don't know the right people, you don't know people already in that institution who can put in a good word for you, you're not going to have a chance to get that job, or at least not as good a chance as somebody who does know the quote unquote right people has connections in that space, right? And so sometimes we talk about racism and sexism as being like a three lap deficit in a five lap race, right? Certain people starting out three laps behind. This is worse than that. This is not even knowing where the racetrack is located. It's not even knowing that there's a race being run that you might enter because if you don't know where that race is and where those jobs are, you can't apply for them. And if you can't apply for them, you can't get rejected from you just didn't even know they existed. Now, is that the result of deliberate racism? Is that the result of deliberate sexism? Not necessarily. You could have nobody in a company, nobody in a school, nobody in any institutional space that was overtly biased. But if we are giving out jobs and opportunities or contracts or whatever on the basis of connections and certain people are more likely to have them than others, because of a history of racially isolated uh, uh, neighborhoods, a history of, of people not really knowing folks as well across racial lines, for instance, or cultural lines, then certain people are gonna be excluded. And it's not, it's not anyone's fault in that space. It's not that they're racist. It's not that they're sexist. It's not that they are classist, right? But they're operating in a institutional framework where they haven't sufficiently questioned the policies and the practices and the procedures that influence how people get jobs, right? Or influence how people come into and become part of an institution. So having that systemic framework requires us to really think about that. Let's process all the things that we do from hiring to recruitment, to financial aid for students, to curriculum design, to, to engagement with the community, to law enforcement on the campus, all of the things that go into operating uh, an institution of higher learning and start to ask ourselves these critical questions. Does this policy, does this procedure, does this practice help further the cause of racial equity or does it detract from it? And how would we know? And if we don't know, how do we find out? Those are the kinds of critical assessments that we need to be doing because a lot of times we don't see the way that our policies and our practices might be having these disparate impacts. You know, it's the same thing with, with higher education and standardized testing. When I look at med schools and law schools, grad schools, and even sort of elite undergrad institutions, placing an emphasis on standardized tests that we're giving to students who, who live in unstandardized neighborhoods, went to unstandardized schools, come from unstandardized backgrounds, were exposed to unstandardized material, and then we give them all standardized tests, and that's how we determine if they even graduate from high school let alone if they're going to be able to go to college. And if they do, which kind of college, which kind of graduate school, right? 
Now, obviously, we're starting to move away a little bit from standardized testing in the era of COVID because it's been difficult for people to prepare for and take those tests in a sort of uh, uh, COVID environment. So hopefully we're learning the lesson that we don't need these things in order to have successful students and successful colleges. But the fact that we've used them, putting standardized tests on unstandardized students and then giving out opportunities on the basis of the outcome guarantees the perpetuation of the inequality that existed in the prior schooling. Is that the result of, of, of admissions counselors being racist or guidance counselors in school or teachers being racist? No, none of them have to be racist for that to be a problem. Because if you take these, these instruments and you use them in a way that perpetuates pre-existing injustice, then you're contributing to injustice, whether you intend to or not. And so we do that in the job market, we do that in schools, we do that in policing, we do that throughout our institutional spaces. Having a systemic framework means talking less about who's biased and who's not and talking more about the informal and formal practices that exist in all of our institutional spaces that can produce inequality. The second thing, in addition to having a systemic framework is understanding that as Dr. Ibram Kendi talks about, there's really no neutrality in this work, right? One is either doing active anti-racist approaches to education or one is collaborating with racism within an institutional space. It's not only with regard to education, any institutional space. If one is not deliberately seeking to undo racial inequity, one is by default contributing to the perpetuation of racial inequity. And I know that that's hard for some folks to hear. They get very sort of defensive when they do hear it. But if we think about it historically, we know it's true, right? Historically, the vast majority of white Americans, for instance, and even white Southerners did not own human property. They were not enslavers. And yet they didn't speak up against the system of enslavement. They weren't abolitionists. They didn't join the abolition struggle. If you ask them, they would say, well, I, you know, I, I don't own any enslaved people. I'm not, I, I don't, I don't own other human beings. So I'm not part of the problem. But if they weren't speaking out against that system and those who did engage in that evil, then they were perpetuating it by essentially assenting to it. The same is true in segregation. Most white folks did not own segregated business. Most white folks did not throw milkshakes on the heads of sit-in protesters at Woolworths in North Carolina or in Nashville or other places where the sit-ins took place. Most white folks didn't burn Freedom Ride buses in places like Anniston, Alabama, but the vast majority of white folks during that time also didn't join the freedom movement. They also didn't protest those businesses. They also didn't refuse to shop in those businesses. They went along with the system as it was. And if you asked them, they would have said, well, I'm not racist. I mean, I would never use a racial slur. I would never burn a cross. I would never do this, that, and the other. I would never attack a, a Black child trying to go to a newly integrated school. But they allowed those things to be done, and most didn't say anything. That's not neutrality. That's not being non-racist, right? That is perpetuating racism. And so as an institution of higher education, if you are receiving students that come through a K-12 space that was profoundly unequal from the beginning, and we know in the state of Minnesota and in, and in, in Minneapolis, we know, for instance, that Minneapolis historically, last time I saw the data was maybe seven or eight years ago, but I would be stunned if it's changed. Minneapolis has the highest disparity in middle school and high school for suspensions and expulsions, racial disparity between black students and white students of any school system in the United States. Now, how is that possible? When I saw that the national average is like two to one, black students like twice as likely as white students to be suspended or expelled. And the last time I saw the data in Minneapolis, it was more on the order of seven or eight or maybe even 10 to one at one point, right? That was how big the disparity was. It may have moved around a little bit, but it was considerably worse. I mean, like four times worse than the national average. How is that possible? The only way that could be possible is if one concluded that Minneapolis had the, the, you know, the worst uh, behaving black people or the best behaving white people in the United States, neither of which is true, right? Which is ridiculous to even assume, but that would be what one would have to assume to justify that disparity. If you're on the receiving end of a system that produces such vast disparity in terms of discipline, in terms of access to advanced level classes, in terms of resources, curriculum, funding, and all those things, then you have to 
take a systemic viewpoint that says it isn't enough to simply receive those students and try to do the best you can. You have to actually work actively to undo the damage of that prior K-12 system and then work with those K-12 educators in schools to actually begin to shape a different reality even before folks come to you. So, you, And as a community college, you're, you're well set to do that. Uh, a lot of schools are not. I think community colleges and institutions whose purpose and whose mission and vision speaks to the needs of the community are in a better position to do that than some institutions because it's right there in your mission. I read your value and vision statement on the website. It's very obvious to me that you all are on the record as saying that that is your purpose, that your vision is to eliminate inequities in outcomes, right? Not simply to try to eliminate disparities in overt treatment, but in actual outcomes. That's a fundamentally anti-racist mindset, which is positive, but in order to achieve that, Right, It's going to be critical for the institution to be working on a regular basis with educators from pre-K all the way through high school to figure out how you change that pipeline of inequality before it gets to you. Right, Because if you have students who are being marginalized before they get to you and other students who are being favored before they get to you, you can do all the work in the world. You can have all the best intentions. You can have all the best vision and value and mission statement on your website, and yet you won't be able to succeed because all of that damage that was done before you're inheriting. And it's sort of like Newton's first law of motion, right? The, we learned about it in what, like third or fourth grade, the law of inertia, right? That an object in motion tends to remain in motion until it's met by another object of greater or equal power to arrest its forward trajectory, right? So if I roll a ball down a hill, it's gonna keep going until it either hits a mailbox or a, a rock or a tree, or you pick it up or it reaches level ground and then the friction slows it down. Same thing is true here. You inherit the legacy and the inertia of a K-12 system that's profoundly unequal. You inherit the legacy and the inertia of a local job market that is profoundly unequal, of neighborhoods and housing situations and housing patterns there in the city that are profoundly unequal, of policing that has been profoundly unequal. You'll be dealing with a, with a student and staff and faculty population that is dealing with the regular traumas of unequal policing, the regular traumas of health disparities, the regular traumas of housing inequity right there in the city, right? And so a community college by definition has to do more than just teach people in that classroom, right? It actually has to become a repository for the community to come and to process some of that drama that's being experienced in the, in, in, in the larger city, not only in that institution, but elsewhere, a place where people can come and talk about those things, a place where people can come and find healing from not just what's going on in the schools, but what's going on in the streets, what's going on in the neighborhoods, what's going on in the community. That is what becoming an anti-racist higher educational institution there would mean, right? It would be connecting with all of those different stakeholders and understanding the, the, the connectivity of the K-12 to the higher education space, attending to that attending to the inertia that is that, that you inherit, the legacies that you inherit, is how you'll be able to take that mission, that vision, and that value statement and turn that into something practical, turn that into something meaningful. So that means that I think you have to have a mission-focused uh, uh, approach. And what I mean by that is that every year from the very beginning, a couple things need to happen. First, that every student who steps on the campus, every staff member who is hired, every faculty member who is hired, and then every staff or faculty member when they are up for performance reviews and evaluations, which you know all employees are from time to time, part of that process of recruiting and then promoting from internally people who are already in, in the institution has to be about evaluating individuals' commitment to and achievement at moving the institution towards your goal of reducing those equi those, those gaps in, in outcome, right? In other words, if I'm, a, if I'm a faculty member at the school, if I'm a staff member at the school, part of my evaluation should, should be about what have I done in the course of that however long that period of evaluation is, to move that mission forward? What have I done to move those values and that vision forward? Am I engaged on that? Can't just be about, you know, did I meet my deadlines and did I get my work done on time and did I show up and teach the class, right? The question is, am I actually contributing to that mission? And, and before I even get hired, that should be one of the questions. What is your commitment to this mission? How do you intend to live this mission? Because I can sit there and look at a resume, right? From the HR department, I can look at a resume of a, 
a person who aspires to teach at the institution or have a staff position or an administrative position at the institution. And I can say, well, you've got a lot of experience. Oh, you're hired. But what kind of experience? That experience may or may not tell me anything about whether you've worked towards this particular mission before? Have you worked in an institution that had this mission? If so, how did that work for you? What were you able to accomplish? Most people don't have that stuff on their resume because most people haven't been in an institution with the kind of mission that you all are aiming towards. So now we have to start asking for that so that we can select with that in mind. That actually becomes a qualification requirement. That becomes an indicator of merit, not just how many years of experience have you had? Have you had supervisory experience? Have you had classroom instruction experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to have all that. But the question is, what have you done to actually help move institutions forward on these critical issues? And if the answer is that you haven't done much, OK, that's not necessarily your fault. But what are your ideas about how you could do that work in this institution? What are your ideas about how you might move the ball forward on that? Because, you know, if you haven't been in a space that asked you that before, you can't necessarily be expected to have done it but at least have some thinking around it, right? Show a commitment to it as a way to demonstrate that you are qualified to be in that institutional space. If we start redefining merit, if we start redefining qualifications to include a proven commitment to and proven success in creating more equitable institutions, then we'll get five years down the line, 10 years down the line, and we'll have those equitable institutions because we selected for that skill in the first place. The problem is if we're not measuring stuff, we're not doing it, right? We're a country and a culture that believes in measuring the stuff that we value and we value the stuff that we measure, right? Whether we're talking about athletic teams where we have you know, the AP rankings, right? We rank so that we know who's the best. We do the same thing with colleges. We have you know, guides to the quote unquote best colleges, med schools, law schools. And the reason we do that is because as a culture, if we're not ranking it, we're not paying attention to it. If we're not selecting for it, if we're not, if we're not grading it, we don't consider it important, which means we have to actually build in to our institutional practices expectations that this set of skills will be considered a vital set before you get hired. And if you're already in the institution, it will be considered a vital skill set in order to get that next promotion or to get, you know, the the uh, work evaluation, a positive work evaluation, that has to become part of our everyday procedure. So everything the school does, from hiring to recruitment of students, to classroom design, financial aid, law enforcement on campus, everything needs to be filtered through the lens of your mission that you have, you've put it out there. I mean, it's right there on the page that you're looking to reduce and eliminate those outcome disparities. And if you hire with an eye toward that, if you promote with an eye toward that, if you evaluate both students and professional staff and faculty with an eye toward that, then you can get to a place in a few years where you can become a model for that, not only in your city, but all around the region and all around the country. If not, right, you'll be continuing to inherit the legacy of all that inequity, and you'll be frustrated. People at the institution will be frustrated, and then they'll start to wonder if it's even possible to eliminate these disparities, because there are a lot of naysayers out there who are going to tell you that you can't. They're going to tell you that it's impossible to eliminate them because all of that inequality for the previous 12 or 13 years is too great to overcome. Well, it is too great to overcome if you don't partner. But if you work with those other institutions and you try to come up with collective strategies where you're working with younger students, even in middle schools, to try to prepare them for higher education, try to prepare them for, to, to see the opportunities that exist in your institution, then by the time they're matriculating through high school and ready to come into college, they're ready to hit the ground running and there's no reason why they can't succeed at that same level, right? And people are gonna tell you that's not possible. So in order to push back, you have to have a systemic framework, you have to have a holistic framework and you have to have a mission driven approach that recognizes that there's no neutral in this one is either actively trying to create and craft anti racist space or you're perpetuating inadvertently with racism that you inherit from a long history in our country that we're still trying to not necessarily live down but to overcome and I applaud you for taking those steps that you've taken so far stay on that course and work with others in your space and in your city to help further that cause because there are an awful lot of good folks there doing a lot of good work in all these different areas. Some working on housing, some working on policing and law enforcement and criminal justice, some working on K-12 
And unless you all work together, it'll sort of be everybody in their own silos spinning their wheels, not necessarily getting to the end result that we all want and need. So I thank you all so much for having me in. I'm looking forward to the questions that you have. I know there were some that were uh, pre-prepared, I think, and then we'll open it up to other folks, but I appreciate y'all. Uh, and I hope that uh, hope that this has been helpful and I hope the rest of the series goes uh, equally well. And, and I look forward to eventually being able to come up and, and spend some time with you in person. But again, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Tim. So yeah, as you said, we've got um, a few set of questions, but also wanna create an opportunity for those that are in attendance. Um, again, continue to use the chat feature. Um, for conversation and dialogue, but if you have a particular question that you would like to have posed to Tim, uh, use that Q&A box. We will monitor that Q&A box for the question. So um, there's a couple of things that you that you talked about in there, um, and, I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute, but I really want to be able to kind of start with this theme around culture, right? So when we talk about, you know, most institutions, when they talk about, you know, being being anti-racist, anti-racism work, you know, heading in that direction, a lot of times um, those decisions are made at the top, right? It's, you know, a group of folks within senior leadership that make those decisions to say, this is the course of action that we're going to take. Um, and then a lot of it nowadays, as we talk about, you know, why now, a lot of it has come in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And so one of the questions that I have for you is, knowing that that's most institutions approach, um, what is the responsibility that falls on leadership? And then what is the responsibility that falls on members of the organization when we talk about moving towards as being anti-racist? Well, I think the, the primary responsibility of leadership is to lead by <laughs> giving up a certain degree of control. And I know that sounds like a contradiction, right? How do you lead? by giving up control when leading is usually seen as being about maintaining and, and exercising control. But what I mean by it is, if you really wanna lead on this kind of thing um, in particular, I think it's critical, and especially for a community-based institution of higher learning to let go of some of the control about what the work looks like and really reach out to the community that the institution is supposed to serve and essentially chartered to serve, it exists to serve, bring them in and find out what they need from the institution, right? Because they're the ones who are gonna be coming there for education, they're the ones who might be coming there to work, they're the ones who, who, who are supposedly the constituents, I hate to use the, the language of customers, right? But the, the constituents for the institution are oftentimes not involved in the planning, the preparation, the delineation of policies. And the assumption is they don't have enough insight to do that, but they do. They know what's not working right now. They know, they know where the institution's falling short and they, and they know what the institution could be, or they may have some ideas and opinions about that. So part of it, and by the way, this isn't just true for, for your institution or for colleges, I think the same is true. If law enforcement is going to be a thing in some way, shape, or form, it has to be under the control of and, and, and with the influence of the community it's supposed to serve. It has to be something where there's some self-determination and some autonomy for the people who are being, quote unquote, policed, just like autonomy and self-determination for the people who are being educated, right? What is school supposed to look like? Well, let's not leave it to a handful of administrators. They might have some good ideas, I'm not saying you cut them out of the process, but I'm saying that their insights need to be blended with the insights of the community to come up with an approach that is not necessarily all bottom up, right? There's still some top down and some bottom up that brings us to a place where we're able to work together to create a different synthesis. And so I think that's what, what real leadership in this moment means. It doesn't mean that every suggestion that a community member has is gospel that you got to go out and do because people in the community can be just as wrongheaded as people at the administrative leadership. It's not like anybody's automatically a genius who knows how to do stuff, right? But, but what we do is we tend to shut out the wisdom of the people. We shut out the wisdom of the community. We assume that they don't know what needs to be done. And I'll tell you, as someone who comes out of a community organizing background, most of the most important stuff that I learned about the economic system and the system of race and racial inequity in this country, I learned from people that I worked with in public housing, almost none of whom had a college education, many of whom didn't even have a high school diploma. They taught me far more 
about those systems that were affecting them and what they needed from me and other people who were organizing than anybody did with a PhD behind their name in my college prep, in, in my college program, right? And so I just think that's, that's, that's really critical. If you want to be a community college, community institution, you got to involve the community from the beginning. Okay. And so with, within that same note, and as we think about buy-in, right? Because in order to be able to, to move some things forward, you have to be able to have buy-in from all those that are involved. And so both with the community stakeholders, as well as the on-campus stakeholders, how does, how does one go about creating buy-in um, specifically for individuals that may have tried to engage, right, in this type of work in the past and may not have fully felt supported by uh, leadership, whether it's current leadership, whether it's past leadership, but then also thinking about those, those stakeholders in the community that may have wanted to do some things but that, that support and that connection had not always been there. Yeah. Well, there is no sort of silver bullet for any of that. I mean, there's no way to just snap one's fingers and, and create either the, the trust that is necessary uh, or the experience that one needs to really do the work well. I, I think it's important to have some, some, some what I would call radical humility around this work, right? And what I mean by that is that for, for the people who want to get the work done, and who have been trying for a long time to get the work done, there is a, a natural, understandable impatience with the pace of change. I'm impatient. I've been doing this work for 30 plus years. Some folks on this call, I'm sure have been doing it that long or longer. Uh, you know, there are people who've been doing it for decades and, and black and brown folks have been trying to do it for generations uh, and we're still facing this thing. So there is a natural impatience, but, but we also have to have, t having a systemic analysis means recognizing that if the systems were structured to produce injustice, it's gonna take a long time to unspool that because we don't even tend to recognize that that was its purpose. We, we, most people are not even at that, at that phase yet. Most people really believe that the systems are basically okay. We just need to sort of tighten them up, tinker with them a little bit, fund them better, train our way out of the problem, get some body cams on cops, you know, whatever, and, and, and the problems will go away. Um, and so if that's where people are, we really can't be surprised that they're not ready to buy in fully to really transformational change because they're not in a headspace of realizing the need for transformational change. They're looking at reform as opposed to a more revolutionary or radical approach. And so this is going to take a moment. And for those of us who already are over here, like ready and been ready, for justice and are impatient at injustice, we have to have enough radical humility to recognize that, that where we are, the only reason we're there already is because somebody taught us, right? And it might've been our experience that taught us. And for a lot of black and brown folk, that would be you know, life experience taught black and brown folks that we got to move faster. And, and not all black and brown folks are clear on that, but overwhelmingly they are. For those of us who are white and, and want to do the work, we clearly had some mentors, some teachers, some teaching that we responded to. And we're just lucky that we had that. If we've had an experience that opened our eyes or we've had a, a mentor that opened our eyes, that's our good fortune. We can't be smug about that and then get mad at someone else because they don't get it yet, right? And like, I use the, I use the, sometimes I, I say it like this, you can't get mad at somebody on Friday for some stuff that you only learned on Monday, metaphorically speaking. Meaning if, if you know, we all are in the process of learning how to do this. And sometimes what happens is when we've learned something and we're angry about something and someone else isn't quite as angry as we are, then we jump down their throat and we think that they're horrible people. And how do you not see this? But this system was designed to keep people from seeing this. This system was designed to keep people from acting on the basis of what they know by keeping them from seeing what's really going on. And so radical humility means that we keep trying, that we have not patience, but that we have persistence at going back to, the, to and, and repeating ourselves. Sometimes people think repetition is just like beating your head against the wall, but I'll tell you what, those of us who've been out here doing this work for 30, 30 years, 40 years, in the last few years, we have seen an exponential increase in the people using the kinds of terminology that y'all are using on your website, a terminology about inequitable outcomes, a terminology of anti-racism, a terminology of systemic and structural injustice. That all, you know, we've been, many of us have been using those terms for years and years and years. And it felt like beating our head against the wall. And then all of a sudden, in the last few years, the dam has broken in terms of the narrative and people are starting to use that phraseology. So that's important to recognize. It's not enough 
right? It's, it's only the beginning, but that is an important beginning without which none of the other work happens. So I think we keep coming back to those stakeholders. We keep trying to engage them. We keep offering that opportunity for them to be engaged at the beginning. I think if I'm a community stakeholder, one of the reasons I might not want to engage with the college is if I feel that the college already has its plans and then I'm just being brought on as an afterthought. Right. So in other words, if the college has already got its vision and value statement, which is fine, but if it also has like a bunch of things it's planning on doing and then it reaches out to some community organization and says, hey, y'all come on and get with our thing. I can understand why somebody in the community might think like, well, but I wasn't even involved in crafting that thing. Why didn't y'all have me in at the beginning? So part of it is making sure that we're coming early to the folks who we want to be involved. Not, af not just after we've got our thing and saying, hey, y'all want to come join our thing, right? No, it's about actually creating the thing from the beginning. And you just keep coming back and doing it over and over again. And, and, and the more you show up in that space, the more that you send the message that you're serious. And I think that the thing that happens is we get so frustrated when, when, when people don't join us that we then assume, well, it's just not doable. And the reality is that that, uh, you know, people have been working at this for an awful long time. And if they had given up that easily, we wouldn't have made one tenth of the progress that we have made as a people. So obviously, it just requires a lot of persistence. Cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears just a little bit. And in, in one of your books, on so your book, Dear White America, um, you talk about a particular study that was done where um, white individuals were kind of shown images, right, of black individuals and the, the, the reaction, the sensory in the brain kind of triggered activity that would yeah. re essentially reflect fear, right? If someone yeah. was afraid and, and, and highly alert and, and fearful. My original question I'm not going to pose because there was actually something that was shared in the chat that can actually, that actually aligns exactly with this notion when we talk about implicit biases. And so as you were talking about, you know, discipline disparities specifically within the state of Minnesota, I want to share this chat and then hear your thoughts and perspective on that. And so in considering that, um, it seems like the, um, we're not considering, based off of what you were sharing, what was shared in the chat is, um, it doesn't seem that to consider the role of student um, or family, the student, the role of the student or family in determining school behavior. Having grown up in an inner city school, I assure you the disparity in discipline is based on the disparity in behavior, not racism of school officials or selective and unequal enforcement. What are well, your thoughts around that kind well, of Two things. Um, obviously, in a given school, the, the, the argument is not that at a particular, let's say, inner city school, there is vast disparity in that school, because in that school, there's not going to be a lot of racial diversity in most instances or economic diversity. In that school, it may be overwhelmingly black and brown students. And that and so anybody who misbehaves in that school, quote unquote, misbehaves, breaks the rule, whatever, is going to be black or brown. That's understood. But what the research is very clear on is that the two to one gaps nationwide and the eight to 10 to one gaps in the city of Minneapolis are not explained. I'm talking about the difference between black students being suspended and exp uh, suspended or expelled and white students is not because those black students break the rules twice as often or eight times more often. There's simply no evidence for that at all. And in fact, the only evidence that we have suggests that when it comes to most of the things that can get you suspended or expelled, the, the most serious behaviors, the differentials are not very great. We have this stereotype where we think black and brown folks are the ones that have weapons at school. Actually, CDC data shows that white kids are just as likely to have weapons on them in their lockers, in their cars, on their persons at school as black kids are, but they're not as likely to be searched and caught. They're just as likely to have drugs. They're just as likely to come to school high. There's a difference in fighting, but it's not it's not eight to one, it's not three to one, it's not two to one, right? And so every single study on this will tell you that the differences in quote unquote behavior do not explain the differences in suspension and expulsion. And again, if they did, then somebody would have to explain to me 
why Minneapolis schools have a suspension rate that is four times the national disparity, because the national disparity is two, two and a half to one. The Minneapolis disparity is between eight and 10 to one. So the only, and there are other inner city parts of the United States, right? It's, it's, and and they, the disparities are not as bad as Minneapolis. Why are black kids in Minneapolis that much worse than black kids in Gary, black kids in Indianapolis, black kids in Chicago, black kids in Nashville, or the white kids in Minneapolis that much better than the white kids in St. Louis or the white kids in Newark or the white kids in Philadelphia. No, there's no rational argument that, and let alone data, that would explain that disparity as the result of behavioral differences. And all of the data tells us that, in fact, white kids are just as likely to break the rules. The difference is usually the biggest gap is coming not for the serious stuff. It's not weapons. It's not fighting. It's not drugs. The disproportionate number of suspensions that are happening in our schools around the country are happening for subjective offenses, disrespect of teachers. That's a very subjective thing. Right. What a teacher perceives as disrespectful behavior can often depend, going back to what you started with, which is the research on on how we process behavior and how we assume a fear response or a danger response with black folks in ways we don't with white folks. What we see, it's not that there isn't, quote unquote, behavior happening. Right. But it's how do we process the behavior? Right. Why is it that black preschoolers are suspended or expelled from preschool? Y'all, we're talking four year olds five-year-olds suspended. And first of all, why is anybody suspended or expelled from preschool? That's just an absolutely ridiculous response to age appropriate acting out, which four-year-olds and five-year-olds just, they just do that y'all. That's just it's what kids do, right? Why would black children at the age of five justify being suspended and expelled at four to five times the rate of white children? Is it because black four and five-year-olds are just evil little monsters relative to white? Of course not. And if you think that it's fundamentally racist, it's not true. It's because teachers are responding to black behavior differently than white behavior, even when the behavior is similar. And what the research on this, and there's a bunch of great research from Indiana University, Russ Skiba uh, has done a lot of the work on this and his colleagues have found that the subjective infractions, which get people written up, and usually most schools, you, know, you get a few write-ups and that's when you get suspended. The write-ups are happening for disrespecting teachers, interrupting teachers in class. And the reality is everyone's doing that stuff. But when some people do it, it triggers that teacher in a different way than when someone else does it. And that is where the disparity is coming in. It's not because the teachers are horrible bigots or horrible racist. A lot of this is happening at a subconscious level, but the research is very clear and consistent that it's happening. And uh, I think, think to suggest that an eight or 10 to one suspension uh, disparity can be explained by behavior is by definition to assume that black people are just inherently more violent, more aggressive, and misbehave more than white people. And, and I don't see how anyone can believe that without being guilty of perpetuating a thought which is fundamentally racist. It doesn't mean that someone who says that is a racist, but it means that that thought is fundamentally rooted in racism. The idea that black people are just that bad and that white people are just that good. And anyone who thinks that uh, should never be allowed in a classroom or around students or in an institution um, that is working with students because that is going to do horrible damage to anybody who comes through that institution. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it supports the research that shows, you know, for specifically for young black boys, by the time they reach the age of five, they're often now perceived and viewed as an adult, right? And so any of those behaviors are now highlighted, right? And so because of that mentality and that mindset, then you get more harsher disciplinary actions when it comes to the same equivalent behavior. And so as, we, as we're thinking about this, right, and how those implicit biases, you know, play a role in how we interact, how we engage, how we instruct, um, you know, one of, the, one of the common things is kind of this, that develops from there is this savior complex, yeah. right? And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, as educators, folks will say, well, you know, many of our students need, you know, extra hand holding, you know, or, you know, those deficit mindset yeah. types of thinking. And so with that in mind, what are some ways that educators can move beyond the savior mentality um, and more into more culturally responsive support practices? Well, that's a great question. And I think the, the problem with saviorism is, uh, <laughs> and again, this goes back to the point I was making about the problem of good intentions, right? 
um, good intentions do not necessarily break down racial disparities. And in fact, they can sometimes perpetuate them if we're not interrogating the, the, the effect. And so if teachers are doing that extra handholding, but that handholding is based not in a belief in those students, but in a belief of their incapacity. In other words, you're holding their hand or you're, or you're coddling them because you actually don't think they are capable of doing better work, you don't think they are capable of succeeding, then that's obviously gonna be something that that student is gonna read uh, from that, from that uh, instructor, from that teacher. And so part of it is, is having high expectations, setting high expectations, but also ensuring that the resources are there for the person to meet those high expectations. Nothing wrong with high expectations, we ought to have them, right? And, and when you have a goal on your website of eradicating uh, inequities and outcomes, that's, that's placing a very high expectation on student success and particularly for, for students of color, which is exactly what you should do. The problem is sometimes we set those expectations as a society and then we don't actually provide the resources and the support in order for people to get there. We don't attend to all the baggage that's coming in that maybe comes from that K-12 system or comes from unequal housing or comes from unequal job opportunities and economic disparity or unequal policing. So, so high expectations are obviously very important and challenging the deficit model is is critical. One of the ways that schools can do that is by making sure that when students come in, that they are given a message of capacity, not incapacity. And you might think that's obvious, but, but let's be real clear about sometimes what we do uh, in higher education is we have this mentality that sort of says, you know, we expect half of y'all to not even finish. You know, we expect, you know, half of y'all won't even finish, maybe two thirds of you won't finish. My, a couple of you might get two-year degrees, but none, you know, you're not going to go get a four-year degree or you're not going to, you know, whatever. We just, it, it's implied. Sometimes it's said. I mean, I remember going to college and having the people at my institution, which was a, a semi-selective school then. It's a very selective school now. I couldn't get in if I bribed somebody now. But, but in those days, I remember even then when it was only like a semi-selective university, I remember the day of orientation. They looked out at the, at the students and they said, look to your left, look to your right. And in four years, two out of three of you probably won't be here. And I thought, well, what kind of message is that, right? What do you say? I mean, first of all, what does that say about your admissions team, right? That they just like two thirds of the people they let in are so bad that they can't even finish. Like what, what kind of thing is that to say about your own people, let alone the students that you let in? We ought to be sending a message from day one that everybody that's there, A, deserves to be there, B, can succeed there, and C, is going to be supported in a way that will allow them to succeed there. And that means meeting them where they are. It means making sure that we're mentoring them not only, and, and by mentoring, I mean not just teaching them the material in the classroom, but actually getting to know them as the individuals that they are, actually getting to know what, what they're dealing with. Are they working two jobs? Are they, are, do they have kids? Are they raising a family that they're trying to you know, put food on the table? Are they helping out with a parent, uh, working to help uh, uh, support a parent or other family member? Because that stuff is gonna influence certain things like are they always gonna be at class at exactly the right time? Are they always gonna get the work done at exactly this time? Or do you have to have some flexibility? That's not setting a lower standard. To, to have flexibility. It's saying, here's the standard. We expect you to meet it, but we're also going to make sure that the standard is attuned to your lived experience. So that means, you know what, if you need an extension of a day to get some work done because you were working a second job to help support your family, cool. Just let us know that and we'll work with you on that. That's not coddling. My kid's school does that. My kid's high school does that. That's what any good institution ought to do is say, listen, we understand things come up. You face certain things. All we're wanting is to make sure that you get this work done and you show us that you're taking that initiative. That is setting a high standard, but it's also making sure that people have the tools needed and the mentoring and the support needed to meet the standard. So that's the opposite of a deficit model, right? That's a challenge model. That's an expectation model. That's saying that, A, I know you can do this. And B, I'm going to be there to help you do this. And if you're having issues with succeeding, let us know what those issues are and we'll figure it out together, right? As opposed to sort of like, well, here's the standard and you'll either do it my way or it doesn't get done, right? Like there's only one way to succeed. There's not only one way to succeed, right? The issue is, are you learning the skills? Are you developing the skills that you need to succeed in that institution and then succeed in life? And there are a lot of different ways to get from point A to point B. And I think one can do that while still maintaining very high standards and rejecting deficit thinking. So as you, you know, as you, you shared a lot and you shared some examples of what institutions can be doing. One of the questions um, that's from our, our audience is, do you have any 
specific examples of colleges or K-12 systems that are doing some of this work and doing it really well? Well, there are individual spaces that are doing it better than others. I'm always reluctant to start giving out uh, pats on the back to any institution because I learned many years ago, the minute that I do that <clears throat> is the minute that something goes sideways the next week. And then all of a sudden people are like, wait a minute, Tim, you said that that college over there was doing really good stuff. And then I saw some crazy stuff that came out of there. And uh, did you just not Google this? Did you not do your homework? So I, I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily put any spotlight on any particular institution, but I will say that there are institutions that I have seen both at the, at the higher education level and at the K-12 level that have begun to go in the direction of holistic assessment of, you know, uh, challenging deficit thinking by having these, these sort of flexible models of, of, of what the work load is within a classroom for students. I've seen institutions that have, that have um, done some of the stuff around hiring that I talked about, which is to say looking at uh, whether or not potential hires have experience doing equity work or contributing to an equity model. And if so, making that part of the evaluation process. I, there are some schools that have done that. Um, there's always pushback against that because there are folks who are going to say, well, if you require that, that's like requiring people to have a certain politic or ideology, right? It's like a litmus test. It's not. You don't have to be somebody who's a liberal or progressive or left-wing person to care about equity. You don't have to be in order, or to have experience with that. I know people with lots of different kinds of politics, and they may have different opinions about how to get to a more equitable institution. We might have disagreements about how to get to that goal that y'all have identified on your website. That's fine. But at least if you've thought about that, if you've given that some thought, if you have some experience with that, you would then be able to know that by evaluating it. And I know some institutions that have begun to do that, but it's a very slow process to actually get where you want to go because, you know, there are always going to be folks that have been in the institution for a long time and it's hard to get people to change who've been doing it a certain way for a long time. But if you start growing your own from the beginning, which is what I've seen some institutions begin to do, then I think you get to a place several years down the line where you're in a different position. Um, but I think that the problem is everyone's trying to figure out this, this problem together and nobody has cracked the code yet, right? Nobody has created sort of the perfect space. I know institutions that have done a great job on curriculum uh, and making sure that the curriculum touches very strongly on equity and anti-racism and, you know, students being required no matter what they're, what they're studying, what their major is, what their concentration is, what they're getting a certificate in, that they have to take a certain number of classes that, that touch on this. I've seen certain schools do that. Uh, I've seen other schools that have done a, a really good job with, you know, orientation and with training. I've seen, you know, uh, seen some schools that have done a great job with, you know, reaching out to the community and trying to bring them in organically from the beginning. But I haven't seen any space that's put the whole package together. So I think you all uh, should be the first so that the next time that somebody asks me this question, I will be able to say without fear of getting it wrong that it's y'all. Uh, and I will be happy to do that if, if y'all uh, attain that, that status. All right, well, I'm looking at the time and I wanna be mindful and respectful of your time. I wanna be mindful and respectful of the time of our, our, our visitors, our guests that are here. Um, I've got a ton of more questions to be able to ask, but hopefully maybe we'll find another time to be able to bring you back and continue on with this conversation and dialogue. But I wanna thank you uh, for your insight. I want to thank you for, you know, just spending time with us today. Um, you know, for those of you that have joined us today, um, I did post a link in the chat. Uh, this session has been recorded. We will make it available on our equity and inclusion events page uh, for you to be able to go back. If there's some things that you miss and want to kind of, you know, rewatch, you will have the opportunity to do that. But again, thank each and every one of you for joining us today for the launch of our anti-racism speaker series. We look forward to engaging you um, for more of these events. Again, we will continue to host, you know, uh, educators, authors, speakers. We'll have some panels. A lot of these things will be coming out um, specifically within uh, the next academic year. So we look forward to being able to continue to not just offer here at Minneapolis College, but we have other individuals from the community and other institutions. And so we thank you for joining us in this journey. And then again, Tim, we just thank you for uh, thank you. being here with us today. Uh, you bet. Thanks, y'all. All right. Appreciate it.